So let's go ahead and get started and just first talk about um, why this project exists. And I'll just mention right now that uh, if you have questions, then um, for now, the best thing would be to type them in the chat and then I'm gonna stop periodically um, and, and check in there. But that's a good way to uh, not forget your question. Um, just jot it down when it occurs to you. Okay. So I'm an ecologist and um, I think about the various ways that anthropogenic change is impacting ecological systems. And there are a lot of ways that um, that's happening right now. So of course, uh, climate change is going on, changes in temperature and precipitation patterns. We have patterns of urbanization and habitat loss and habitat land use change, et cetera. And insects are, you know, one of the foundational uh, parts, segments of an ecosystem and one that have received a lot of attention in the last several years, a little bit alarming attention. Uh, and there have been some popular articles about potential insect apocalypses. And well, there's, there's certainly bad news from certain parts of the world with respect to different types of insect groups. And I think uh, what we've seen, whether it's Lepidoptera in some places, butterflies and moths, uh, just flying insects in general and in other parts of the world, um, et cetera. There's all of these anecdotal stories of insect declines. And something that we don't have a good handle on right now is actually how general and uniform uh, those declines are. Because of course, if someone were to conduct a study and find that insect populations are perfectly stable for 30 years, that wouldn't be quite as dramatic a headline. It wouldn't get quite the attention. So uh, in some cases, there, there are biases in terms of what kinds of things get published and what kinds of things um, draw our attention the most. But the other challenge is just that there's not a lot of good standardized monitoring data sets that allow us to compare evenly over time. And so, you know, one of the questions with respect to um, this idea of insect declines is, can we, can we set up a monitoring system that allows us to do that? And I'm a bird ecologist, and what I'm especially interested in is insects as bird food. And when you think about insects as bird food, not only does it matter how much what the biomass of insects is out in a natural ecosystem, but what's the timing of availability of that insect bird food? And so that's where we start talking about these ideas about phenology, the seasonal timing of things. So in a, in a typical sort of North American forest environment, right, we go from winter um, and now here in North Carolina, we're, we're almost closer to this right-hand picture than this middle picture but I'm sure many folks uh, in the country are still kind of in that middle picture. Trees are just starting to leaf out. Those leaves, uh, those freshly emerged leaves are largely undefended in terms of secondary compounds. And so extremely tasty to insect herbivores that can take advantage of those. So what we tend to see is that there's this peak in insect abundance, um, you know, on the earlier side of summer, late spring or early summer, before those leaves have gotten really defended, before plants have started pumping defensive compounds into those leaves, we tend to see this peak in insect herbivores. And so one question of course is, well, let's say with climate change, if, if trees are starting to leaf out earlier, are insects also starting to leaf out earlier? So that's a question about phenology. And we care about both of these questions. You know, are insects declining? Where and by how much? But also are insects shifting their seasonal timing? And for both of these questions, there's sort of a, a geographic component because we know that climate change is happening to different degrees in different parts of the world. Even different parts of North America are ex experiencing different degrees of climate change. That may lead to different degrees of responses in the insects uh, in various ways. 
And, you know, I mentioned that I'm an avian biologist, right? And uh, ornithology, avian biology, birds are a classic um, ex example of a success story of citizen science in that we train these amateur bird watchers to go out and collect observations that allow us to duplicate an animation like this one, which seems to only work the first time through, but hopefully you were briefly dazzled by these colors. Um, escape out of this and try to restart that page. Oops. There we go, right? So for in this particular case for indigo bunting, we know exactly what time indigo bunting starts showing up in different parts of the continent, thanks to uh, the citizen scientists, amateur bird watchers, right? And now you can imagine that a, a bird that's spending its winter in Central America or South America even uh, may not be aware if, if spring is coming warmer, let's say where I am in North Carolina, trees are leafing out earlier than they used to, insects are coming out earlier than they used to. Uh, if you're a bird wintering in Central or South America, you may not realize that, right? You may come at your quote unquote normal um, migration time. And as a result, you may actually miss that early season um, peak in resource availability, um, or it's not that you yourself will miss the peak, but by the time that you have, um, you know, built, you know, attracted a mate, built a nest, laid eggs, incubated those eggs, and those eggs have hatched. At that point, it could be that that insect peak has already dropped off. And really, um, the, the main reason that bird migration has evolved in the way it has is to take advantage of this seasonal peak in resources. And with climate change, there's this concern that different parts of an ecosystem may be responding to different degrees to that climate change leading to this offset or what we call a phenological mismatch. So um, birds are a great example of a success story in citizen science in terms of harnessing, you know, the interest of bird watchers everywhere, centralizing that data in a way that's really useful for researchers to better understand the pattern and timing of bird distribution. What we don't have to really understand whether birds are getting mismatched with their food resources or not is an understanding of um, the timing, the seasonal timing of that bird food. And that's why we started Caterpillars Count. So at heart, the idea of Caterpillars Count is we wanna know how much bird food is there in a particular location on a particular day. And then we wanna know uh, that same information, that same estimate of bird food, we want to establish that at multiple points in time over the course of a season so we can kind of establish what that curve looks like and when exactly during the bird breeding season was there a peak in insect resources. So the fundamental unit uh, of analysis and of participation is a branch survey. We look at an individual um, tree branch or shrub and record what kinds of bugs were on it. And although the project is called Caterpillars Count, as you'll see, um, we actually are rec recording all, all different kinds of octopods we come across. Now, as part of uh, this project, of course, we have um, various resources. So including, we have a free mobile app for submitting data. We have um, training materials and guides and games to help people learn how to identify arthropods to order, more or less order, um, which is what we expect participants to be able to do. So caterpillar versus beetle versus fly, etc. cetera. Um, on our website, uh, we have various ways that you can explore and visualize the data that you've collected or that anyone else has collected as part of the project uh, anywhere uh, in the world, which is North America so far. Uh, historically, we've targeted Caterpillar's Count towards nature centers and school groups. Um, and the main reason is that unlike uh, a citizen science project like iNaturalist or eBird, if you're familiar with those, uh, where you can basically participate 
with you, know, you can participate one time by submitting one photo or submitting one bird checklist, and uh, you know that's that's fine. There's there's information embedded in that. Um, you don't need to. You can do more with those platforms, but you don't need to do more um, for that record to have value. For our um, aims of establishing phenology, it's a little bit more involved, of course, right? So we can't just characterize a site by looking at a single branch because insects are very patchy in space. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But um, so we need to look at a bunch of branches. And as I mentioned, we need to look over time. So repeatedly every week or two. And uh, so most individuals are probably not in so interested in putting that much time and effort into this project. Certainly we do have some individuals who are very much uh, interested and committed to participating in that way. But at a nature center or a zoo or a school group at a school, um, you can kind of divide and conquer or you can take advantage of different visitors or participants who are coming every weekend. You can get them involved. Um, and so the actual participants are maybe doing sort of one-off but that data is kind of getting organized at the scale of a site, which, which um, someone has to have the, the foresight to create in advance. Um, we have a number of educational resources, uh, most of which we have not created ourselves. We've created several, but we, we link to various um, educational activities related to biodiversity, climate change, um, data analysis, phenology. Etc. And so um, in the webinar today, I'm going to kind of expand on, on all of these pieces and just give you a sense of what it actually takes to create a site and to actually do these surveys. Um, and again, what, what resources we have to, to help you out or to help your participants out with that project. Okay, so I'm going to start out by kind of more thoroughly describing what exactly I mean when I say a caterpillar's count site, or if I say, hey, maybe you would like to create a caterpillar's count site. Um, so a site is a, basically it's a set of branches that are, you know, within, it could be within your backyard. Um, in this current uh, global pandemic era we're living in, we understand that actually many zoos, many nature centers may uh, have limited capacity to um, bring in volunteers and do this project now. There are a lot more people, however, who are stuck at home uh, and maybe have some good foliage in their backyard. And uh, so, you know, we're hoping that for some people, uh, this might be something they decide to, to start in on their own property or in you know woods that are that are nearby their own property they can easily get to so if you were to create a site that means you're going to say okay uh i'm going to set up some branches that i will try to i'll try to survey that set of branches all on the same day at some frequency or at some interval and our branches are um, organized in groups of five and we in this slide here, you can see they're kind of different colors with a, a larger central red, red branch, and then four satellite branches around that. Um, I'll describe the spatial setup. The spatial setup is totally flexible. It does not have to look anything like this diagram. But, um, well, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. But I just want to show you what it looks like here. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go to the website. Here's what our website looks like. And I'm just going to show you how easy it is to create a site. And if you were to create a site, you don't need to ask permission. Um, you don't need to say, hey, I was thinking about doing it. You know, is it OK? Do you need a site in Illinois? Whatever. You, no permission. If, if this is of interest to you, you have all the tools you need to go out and get started. Um, the first thing you'll need to do is create an account. And you can do that. Um, I think the very first time, if you're not logged in, uh, you'll see a sign in or a create account button at the top right. But it, it's remembered me 
once you've created a personal account, you just use your own email address um, and come up with a personal password. Uh, you can go to my account and there's a create new site button. And if we click that, it takes us to this page where basically um, we just need a little bit of information and we're good to go. So first of all, a site name. How are, how are we going to refer to this? I mean, this might be um, you know, Prairie Ridge Environmental Center. If it's you know, an actual nature center or a zoo, you have some name, some official name. In that case, if you do have an official name, you can put the, your organization's URL down here. But maybe it's just uh, it's going to be my backyard, right? And so I'm going to put something like that. Uh, my only caveat with the site name is just that um, there may be hundreds of sites across the country. You want to make sure that it's something fairly uh, specific and identifiable to you. If my name were Smith, maybe I would want something a little bit extra in that site name. Okay, so the name, the the URL. Just a one or two sentence description, um, especially, you know, if you're a nature center uh, or a zoo or something like that, then maybe you want people to understand what type of organization you are. Um, if you just want to say it's deciduous forest, suburban habitat or whatever, that's fine. Um, but, and I'll show you, it, this site description really matters most for people who might want to um, discover your site. It, whether your site is a particular place that they could get involved in Caterpillar's account. And I'll skip to the bottom, there's a little checkbox that says, make site public, allow people to contact me about it. So if you are an official organization, a nature center that expects and desires visitors, if you check that box, then you show up in a directory where people who might be looking for, hey, where can I do this near me? You'll show up and they'll know from the site description exactly what you are. Um, if you are a backyard, you probably don't want people to contact you and you uh, would uncheck that box. Uh, then you locate where you are on the map here. Let's on the map. So we can zoom in. Let's pretend I'm in Michigan right now, right? So just find, find exactly where you are. Um, and then the final two things you need to do are decide how many survey branches, how many plants you're going to survey at this site, uh, you'll have a better sense of how many that should be as I continue talking more about the, the protocol. But I'll just say that the minimum to set up a site, it starts out at 10 and it increases by, you can increase it in these groups of five, these survey circles of five survey branches a piece. So for any, anywhere from 10 up, and we have some sites that are doing like 80 survey branches, Many places are doing 20. Um, I'll talk more about uh, the implications of that number of survey branches in a bit. And then lastly, when you create a site, you'll just you'll choose a site password, which is different from your username password, your individual password. The site password is what you're going to share with anybody who might be doing a survey at your site. So this site password allows people to submit data to Caterpillar's account for your site, gives them that permission. So again, if you're a nature center and you have people who are you know, using the app on their phone, you, know, you can make it something simple that you could tell them um, and you can always change that later on. So with, with that information, you can click the create site button and you, you're good to go. You will be, you'll be in the system. Um, so let's see, let's talk about actually the, the next steps. Uh, if you, so if you do, again, you don't have enough information yet to decide maybe if this is right for you, but let's say um, you decided, okay, I'm, I'm in, I wanna create a site. I, I do this, I fill out this form online, great. Now, when you log into the website and you go to my account, you go to manage my sites and your site will show up in this. It'll show up in this little drop down. Now I, I'm, I'm the master of all sites. I see all sites that are listed, right? So 
um, you will just see your own site that you created listed here. So let's pretend I'm up at Acadia National Park in Maine. Here are the tools that I can um, do. And the, um, the way this is going to work is that I mentioned you're going to identify some survey branches in your backyard or at your nature center or whatever it is. And it's those exact same branches that you're going to monitor every time you do surveys, which means you're probably going to want to hang a tag from those branches. And so we have a simple way to create those tags. So here's the print tags button to go into manage my sites. And when I click on that, it pulls up this printable PDF. And what you can see, each one of these rectangles, each one of these colored rectangles is a different branch tag. So we could print this out. We can cut out all these rectangles. And what you see on one of them is it has printed out the name of my site, Acadia National Park, the Alder site. It, it mentions which survey circle. Again, that circle is a group of five survey branches. So they're um, the five different colors. So circle one, there's five tags, and then it switches to red again, and it's circle two, and it starts going through all the, the colors again. Um, it also says what plant species that particular branch is. Make sure we're at the right place. And then in really large letters, you can see there's each of these branches has a unique three-letter code. And I'll show you later on. But that three-letter code is basically what you're going to enter when you do a survey. And just by typing BQB, Caterpillar's count knows, oh, you're in Acadia National Park um, at that survey branch in circle one that's an American mountain ash. Um, okay, now, obviously, at some point, you know, the computer is not magically going to know what tree species you have put these, you've chosen for your survey branches. So, actually, I'm going to close this window. We're going to go back. So, this, this is again, the my account, manage my sites. These are my options for manage my site. Um, and you can do this in the app actually. So if you decide to set up a site, you might, let's just say you decide to set up um, 20 survey branches. You've done that when you created the site, you said, okay, give me 20 branches. Then you can go into the manage my site page, click on edit survey plants. If we said 20 survey branches, well, they'll show up as four groups, four circles, circle one, and circle one has these five plant codes, circle two. So I'm just clicking on the circle and it expands to the five survey branches within each one. But so here we, we were just looking at these branch code tags, BQB, BQC, et cetera, right? So this is the place where you can walk around and say, oh, this would be a good branch. And if you can identify plants, then great. And then you can type that in. Um, if you're not sure and you want to leave it blank, that's totally fine. This data gets becomes a little bit more valuable if eventually you can fill this in. And as long as you do it eventually, we'll be able to link that information to the data, the, the, the insect and arthropod data that you've collected to plant species. But you don't have to. You're not limited. And in some cases, you might start doing surveys and not till the end of the season do you have time to go around identifying these plant species. You can enter this at any point. But that's once you've entered it, once you've entered it, then it'll show up on those plant tags. So um, if you are able to identify the plant species, then I recommend um, sort of choosing those branches, figuring out which plant species each one is, entering that in here, then printing the tags and hanging the tags. And I should mention that um, kind of the, the simple weatherproofing that we do for those tags, we just put them on regular paper and then we, we laminate them in uh, by folding it in packing tape. So we just fold, we wrap packing tape on both sides, then poke a hole and hang it by a twist tie and it works fine for a couple seasons. Um, Okay, I'm going to do one more push before I take the first set of questions um, because I think you need a little bit more of a sense again of how we go about laying out these survey branches. And, and it does, and it, um, I want to emphasize that we are super flexible in 
um, how we let folks do this. I'm just gonna talk through the ideal branch selection procedure and then re-emphasize it's fine if it doesn't um, in reality look very much like that. Okay, if you are on a very, in a very wooded area with lots of branches and foliage to choose from. Um, well, first of all, so you're gonna arrive at some number of survey branches that, um, that reflects you know, the amount of effort you feel like you could actually commit to this project, right? Uh, it says, uh, I guess it doesn't give the breakdown, but you could budget maybe about five minutes per survey branch. Um, so if, if you're a nature center or environmental you know, education center or a zoo, we, we strongly encourage doing at least 30 branches. Um, and the reason again gets to, gets to this idea that the insects are just really patchily distributed in space. And you might look at five or 10 branches and not see very much of anything. And then on that 11th branch, you suddenly see all this stuff. And what that means is that to get a, a good accurate estimate of uh, you know, what, you know, that measure of insect density or biomass on that given day, the more, the larger our sample size, the better. Um, so what 30 survey branches equals to at five minutes a survey branch, um, and that five minutes can very much come down uh, to just two minutes a survey or something like that as you go. But at five minutes a survey branch, that would be two and a half person hours to, to cover all of those survey branches, right? Now, if you only have one, you know, dedicated staff person who's doing this, then that's a significant time commitment per week, let's say, if, if you were to try to do that weekly. Uh, whereas if you had a group of five people, well, that's only half an hour. So it's a very, this, this project is very amenable to sort of divide and conquer. Um, you'll have to think through what are the, the human resources that are gonna be helping carry this out and what's feasible. And then again, what's the spatial area that you have to work with? Do you have enough branches? If you're just in your backyard, and actually I've got, you know, there's, that's this next slide here, right? If you're just in your backyard, you may be hard pressed to come up with 10 survey branches. Again, that's sort of our minimum. It's not really worth, worth doing this um, if you do, if you look at many fewer than that. Um, but, you know, 10 branches would be fine. And again, that's um, much less than an hour a person hour per survey day. Um, and again, if you use the beat sheet survey, and once you start getting into the flow of things, that might only be 15 or 20 minutes to, to do 10 survey branches for one person. Um, okay, so here's, here's the ideal. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the, the scenario where you, you have lots of trees to choose from. Now, obviously you have to choose from trees you can reach, branches that you can actually inspect manually, right? Um, so in some cases, all the branches with good leaves start a little bit too higher. And so you may have lots of trees, but not very many usable branches from our perspective. Um, but if you have a lot, what we wanna do is have a semi-standardized means of choosing these branches. We don't wanna be um, biased, we wanna have we want to sample what we call representative vegetation for the site. So, you know, maybe we actually have some favorite plant species and we kind of would prefer to put all of our surveys on those, or there's some unconscious bias that we just happen to gravitate towards, you know, whatever that, that favorite plant species is. Um, so to get away from those kinds of biases, what we do is we first acknowledge the fact that you are going to be limited on some level in terms of, okay, well, there happen to be trees over here, but not over here. Um, so at that level, you're going to subjectively choose a location and we're gonna say you're subjectively basically choosing the location of a survey circle of where this red, where this red tree is in the center of this group of five. That's chosen subjectively based on the fact that there's a bunch of vegetation nearby. And once you've chosen that center tree, Again, if you have lots of foliage to work with, then um, we wanna choose uh, each of, we wanna choose our four satellite trees 
basically in the four cardinal directions, just walk five meters and choose the closest tree that you come to going north, south, east, and west. Doesn't have to be exactly, it's just, you know, again, in, in four sort of opposite directions. And that sort of gives you the standardized tree selection where you're not, you're not being biased uh, necessarily by um, choosing certain kinds of trees over others. Now, again, if you're in an environment where you don't have a lot of foliage to work with, it may be that you are literally just using every branch that you have available to yourself. Um, and so the, the layout may not look anything like this, um, this one here. But um, so I wanna emphasize that it's totally fine. You don't need to ask permission about the layout. In some cases, maybe on, in a zoo, um, guests walk along you know, walkways and pathways, but you don't want them going off of those walkways. So they're never gonna be you know, going way far off, in which case all of your survey branches may just be in a line. That's totally fine. They're still conceptually going to be in groups of five, five along the path here, maybe a little break, five along a path there. And if they all work out linearly, that's totally fine as well. Okay, I am going to, um, I'm gonna pause here and check the chat, see if anybody has popped any questions up there or you can type them in or you can just unmute yourself and um, ask, oops. Just ask your question, but for some reason I'm having trouble seeing the chat. At the moment, I'm just going to stop the share for a second. There we go. Okay, I can see the chat. Uh, can a weird message about my mic? Can I hear myself? Yes, I can. Okay, hopefully my audio was working better if it was tuned out before. Um, so do folks have any, okay, that's great question. Are you looking at just one branch per tree, the entire length of the branch? Um, right, that, so the, the details of how that survey works, I'll get in, that's actually the next thing I'm gonna get into with my wonderful tree branch right next to me. It's a plastic tree. But um, the ideal is, just one branch per tree. Um, but we, cert we have certain cases, actually we have, um, there, we have some sites where there's actually a quite a large tree with sweeping branches that are, I mean, these branches are sweeping down on all sides and there's plenty of great foliage to look at and they're, they're separated by 10 meters or so because they're on different sides of this big canopy. And it's totally fine to have multiple branches on a tree and especially if you're limited um, in choosing foliage, but especially if, you know, often because we're looking at what is um, at kind of eye level, these tend to be off smaller trees or saplings, in which case it's good to, to just be looking at um, one branch per individual tree or shrub. And I didn't, I didn't actually emphasize that uh, before that I've been talking about trees and really this project is specific to woody vegetation. So this is not something to do in a meadow or in your garden. Um, it's specifically woody vegetation because again, we're trying to measure bird food for foliage gleaning birds um, who are foraging in woody vegetation. Um, okay, so uh, any other questions for now before I transition into just what the survey actually looks like? That'll give you a better sense maybe. Okay, well, if you think of any, then feel free to, um, again, drop them in the chat and I will look back at that. So actually, okay, so um, pull my branch over. Now this branch, it happens to have a little tag hanging from it with my three letter code here. It's laminated in this shiny tape, protecting it from the elements of my living room. Um, okay, so how does the survey actually work? Why does it take five minutes? Um, now, importantly, we actually have two different survey methods um, and you can choose whichever of those methods 
you think will work best for you or the people at your site who would be doing these surveys. And there's a bit of age dependency that you'll, um, you'll see in a moment. But the first, the first method is called a visual survey. It doesn't require any materials whatsoever, aside from you know, either a phone to use our app to enter the information or a paper data sheet, which we provide on the website you can download. So a visual survey, and this method was actually developed by avian ecologists in New Hampshire um, in the early 1970s. It's been used con con continuously since that time. Uh, basically, you examine a standardized section of branch. So that was the question Susan asked about, do you look at the entire length of branch? Well, of course, some branches are gonna be short, some branches are gonna be long. And um, so that's problematic in terms of, you know, what does that number mean if, if the size of the branch or the, uh, the number of leaves is varying? And so um, what we do is we say, okay, in a visual survey, the way we're standardizing it is we are picking an area of 50 leaves. Um, and so whether it's a, a, a branch with a lot of leaves or a branch with just a few, we're going to cover at least 50. And um, it's not just the leaves, but it's the associated twigs and petioles. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna carefully inspect both the upper and underside of each one, disturbing that branch as little as possible. Because of course, if we are really bumping that around, then there are some insects in there that might fall off or be disturbed and fly away. Now, it can be challenging if I were to just start and say, okay, here's my first leaf, one, two, three, four. Oh, I found a bug and then I get all excited about the bug and I have to figure out what kind it is. I'm gonna record how long it is in millimeters. But by the time I do all that, I've lost track of what leaf count I was on. So what I like to do um, is actually count out the, the area of 50 leaves in advance. You want those to be 50, an area of 50 contiguous leaves and so I'll just kind of scan the branch and count up to some visual landmark. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, And then I'll say, oh, okay, my 50 leaves is gonna take me basically, if I start on this branch tip, it's gonna take me to the fork right back in here or something like that. Something I can recognize ideally so that now I don't have to worry about that counting anymore. Now I'll just focus on looking for bugs and finding bugs, right? And so scanning and, and training yourself, and this part takes practice, right? But to be really carefully looking over the petioles and twigs in addition to the both leaf surfaces. And of course, insects have evolved for millions of years to not be found by things looking for them, right? So of course, many of these things are somewhat cryptic or camouflaged. Um, and so it does take very careful uh, examination. Um, for that reason, <clears throat> this visual survey protocol is not our recommended protocol for kids that are, especially kids that are younger than middle school. And even for some middle schoolers, we may not necessarily trust that they are going to examine exactly 50 leaves and that those 50 leaves will be so carefully inspected. Um, if, if kids are your primary um, audience or, or a group of participants, or you just want a little more active and fun and engaging methodology, it, re it, does re it requires you to build a beat sheet. And this is a homemade beat sheet. We have instructions. We have a, a linked instruction sheet for how to make one of these, but it's literally just a white square of sheet that's um, two feet by two feet. And um, we use just molding. You can buy this molding in 10 foot strips. You cut one of those 10 foot strips into four pieces and that will help you make two beat sheets basically. Um, so if you have the wherewithal to make a beat sheet, um, you can get creative with how you do this. The exact size is not critical. <clears throat> you hold a beat sheet under a branch and Get a, whack, take a stick, I'm holding an imaginary stick, and you whack the branch 10 times, and then you get to just inspect all of those things that were so cryptic on the branch have now fallen into your nice white beach sheet. And 
they're a lot easier to, to see and identify potentially. Um, so with the beat sheet, uh, we, we don't standardize that number of leaves that we examine the way we do in a visual survey. And yet the number of leaves that is getting sampled when you whack a branch like this is going to vary from branch to branch, just based on the density of leaves, right? That are, and, and how much of the branch you can get over your beat sheet. So that's something actually we have, we get you to estimate. And um, so again, this is, this is a, this, the other advantage of a beat sheet as a survey method is that it's obviously a lot faster than that painstaking examination. So um, this is where it might only take you a minute or two per survey to do a beat sheet survey. Whereas it might take closer to five minutes, um, five or six minutes even to depending on the orientation of the leaves and all of that to do, to do that one. Um, so I'm going to actually step through uh, what the app looks like. And I'm going to, let me go back to sharing my screen here. And this also gives you, um, oops, sorry, screen, there we go. Okay, and so the app, um, we have free mobile app, it's on Android and, oops, um, and Apple iOS. But if you want, you can download a paper data sheet and submit it on the website. So what, what I'm actually gonna show you is the submit observations page of the website. Which, which looks pretty much like the app. It's just gonna be stretched really wide on a computer screen. But this is what your, your, your phone would look like. So remember um, those branch tags, they have a three letter code. So your user will walk up to a branch, they'll see the tag, they'll enter a code from that branch. I'm gonna enter EJR because it's just one of our test site branches. It's not, it's not gonna send this fake data to any um, real site in our database. So EJR, it says, oh, I know where you are. You're at our example site on an American beach branch. And it automatically knows the date and time. We specify whether we're gonna do a visual or a beach sheet survey. Um, we can type in any notes, unusual things about the day. Maybe there was a big storm last night um, that might affect you know, arthropod activity or, um, we actually have a check checkbox for whether leaves are wet due to a storm overnight. Um, because again, we expect that might affect that. So that's something you can check or not. Uh, you say, okay, continue. We're doing a beach sheet survey at this branch. Did you see anything or not? Sometimes you may actually see nothing, but when you do, it'll give you this drop down. And again, these are the, these are the groups that, um, these are some of the common groups that we expect people to be able to identify. We'll get into uh, some of the resources we have for training people to identify these later on. If it's not one of these listed groups, then and you know what it is, you can always select other and type um, uh, what what it is. Or it could be that you're you're still learning to identify things and you're not sure what it is. Maybe it's one of these things, but you don't know. So you can call and identify. Um, we have a couple of extra buttons for those of you who are, who are aware there are um, insects that are in the order of with bees and wasps called saw flies whose larvae look just like caterpillars um, if you know that then you can you can call it a bee wasp saw fly and check that it was a larva um, if you don't realize that and you mistakenly call it a caterpillar that's actually fine because effectively from a bird's perspective they're caterpillars so this is really just for folks who know. Similarly, beetle larvae, we have a checkbox. Um, and of course we have separate entries for caterpillar versus um, adult butterfly or moth. If it's a caterpillar, we have these extra special checkboxes. A caterpillar might be hairy or spiny. It might be rolled up in a leaf um, or in a big silk tent. These are all characteristics that might impact this caterpillar's accessibility as bird food. Um, we record the length 
of that caterpillar. Maybe that was a 35 millimeter caterpillar. Maybe there were several of them. So we can in increase uh, the length there. In, um, and then optionally, we can upload a photo. Now, uh, this, this photo upload, we don't expect people to necessarily take a photo of every single arthropod they come across over the course of all their surveys. Um, that's gonna be a lot of arthropods potentially. Some of them are gonna be the exact same arthropod over and over. And we don't need, you know, it, it might not be very gratifying to take a photo of that exact same ant, um, you know, every time you come across one. We do strongly encourage folks to take photos of caterpillars. Um, and this gets to actually the reason the project is called Caterpillars Count, even though we are recording all of these things, and I should have said this at the outset, is that for small songbirds, caterpillars, picture just your small green inchworm, geometrid moth caterpillar. They are just the little green protein sausages of the forest. They're just all soft parts, not a lot of hard parts, all digestible protein, and they are a preferred prey item for feeding young nestlings for many songbirds. And so that's why we especially care about those caterpillars. And we have some other efforts where we're you know, interested in linking caterpillars to you know, butterfly and moth monitoring efforts, et cetera. So caterpillars get that special place in our hearts and in our project name and in our recommendation to take photos. Um, caterpillars are very cool. Um, just in general, but you can take a picture of anything, anything you find is cool, or you have a participant who just really loves beetles. Um, if you take a photo with our app, our Caterpillars Count app, that photo will automatically get shared to iNaturalist. Um, it does, if you have an iNaturalist account, it doesn't get linked to your account. Um, we can't do that, but it does get shared to iNaturalist through the Caterpillars Count account. And in that way, especially for people who were excited to follow up on their observations and learn, well, I knew it was a beetle, but I really wanted to learn what kind of beetle. Well, they can follow up with their observations later on um, if they take a photo in the app. Okay, so when you save that, um, okay, it shows up. All right, we're in the middle of a survey here, right? So we might, maybe we see some other things. Maybe we see an ant. A very small ant, two millimeters, I'm not going to take a photo, right? So every time I observe something, it's going to show up in this card. And when I finish my survey, I'll hit continue. And it'll double check um, where I am. So if you have previously entered, you know, oh, well, which, which plant species is that branch BCQ or whatever it was, um, it'll autofill. But if you never did that, this will be blank and your user, if they know it, they can enter it or they can leave it blank, et cetera. If you did a, if you did a visual survey, then this number of leaves is gonna be 50. You're not gonna be able to edit it. It's gonna be um, filled in for you. But if you did a beat sheet survey, then that's actually something you're gonna to need to count is you know, after you do the survey and you've looked in your beat sheet, you've entered all the stuff, now, I hold my beat sheet back up to the branch and I say, okay, how many leaves actually were poised over that branch when I whacked it? And that's the number. I'm, and you could, that can be an estimate. And especially, you know, some trees with really large leaves, that might, number might be as low as, as 10, you know, some kind of big leaf magnolia or something like that. Maybe you only have six or 10 leaves. Whereas, um, some other tree species, chalk maple has these pretty small leaves and we get sometimes three or 400 leaves in a single branch. And again, you can estimate those obviously to the nearest 10 or 20 or 50 um, if the number is very high. But you'll enter that. You'll enter leaf length. That is, okay, in from um, the tip of the leaf to the, the base, where the petiole starts, so not including the petiole. How long is that leaf in centimeters? And then lastly, you will assign an herbivory score. And so in some cases, you might look at a branch and actually you find no bugs, but you can see that the leaves are really heavily chomped. So clearly there were bugs there at some point in the past. 
And so that herbivory score um, can help us kind of capture that information. And we do that by recording an estimate of the percentage of leaf area that's been damaged. And this is something that can be a little bit tricky uh, to estimate, but the way to think about it is in terms of, you know, like 50 leaf samples. If you did a visual, leaf, a visual survey, well, you actually inspected an area of 50 leaves. Um, if you did a beach sheet survey, imagine an area of 50 of those leaves. And if you were able to, in your imagination, take all those little leaf holes and compress them together, how many leaves worth of holes would you have looking at your branch? And so the real question, you know, most branches show some sign of herbivory. Often there's gonna be some trace herbivory, one to 5%. So the real question is learning to distinguish trace from light herbivory, that is more than 5% herbivory. And 5% of 50 is two and a half. So really the way to think about it is if you can in your head, see all these little leaf holes, smush them all together and say, oh, are there more than two and a half leaves worth of holes? If so, then that bumps me into the next herbivory category. Are there more than five leaves worth of holes? If I put it all together, that would bump me into moderate. Um, so that's how we um, suggest people think about uh, calculating or figuring out or estimating that herbivory score. And then, and then that's it. You click finish and that is a branch survey. Uh, it's telling me I didn't, I didn't enter a leaf length, but that's okay. We don't need to enter this fake data anyway here. Um, so let me stop and take questions. Looks like we have another question. Ah, great question. What about tree species that have leaflets? Would you consider each leaflet as a leaf in this case? Absolutely, perfect question. So for compound leaves, hickories and ashes, things like that, um, consider each leaflet on that um, compound leaf a separate leaf in our leaf count. If you're counting how many, um, you know, 50 leaf area, et cetera. Um, and I guess what that also brings up, so some trees have very tiny leaflets. And actually um, something I didn't mention is that basically the, the, the criteria for a branch being suitable for use in this project uh, needs to be woody plant. So a tree or a shrub I mentioned, obviously needs to be at a level that you can actually observe it. Um, that is low enough that you can inspect it. Um, and then on average, the individual leaves or leaflets, if it's a compound leaf, um, should be at least two inches in length, five centimeters in length on average. Some of them can be smaller if on average they're. And that's mainly um, just because for certain trees that happen to have very, very tiny leaves, some legumes, um, a 50, examining 50 really tiny leaflets is is kind of not worth it. Again, it's it's from that that sample size perspective. Um, it's not worth, or or the data just aren't as meaningful if it's a really tiny sample like that. So that's why we have that minimum leaf size. Uh, are there any other questions about the nature of how these surveys are conducted or carried out? Uh, and you need to specify what type of habitat the tree is in. Um, no, that, that information is hard to capture, um, e.g. wetlands. So, I mean, I guess what I would suggest is you can have kind of your generic site description, which maybe describes that, oh, this site includes deciduous forest and wetland and whatever habitats. Um, at the tree level, we don't worry about trying to capture that information. Now we will have the lat long for your site, just kind of the, wherever that central pin you drop to represent your site. So <clears throat> we can, um, if we ever attempt to do anything with land cover and habitat like that, we can try to extract that information from the lat long, but we don't worry about specifying it at the level of a tree. Um, 
Okay, but, oh, great. What do you do? So we captured all these things in the beat sheet. Um, and then what do we do? So what I typically tell folks is that um, caterpillars count. So, you know, caterpillars, many caterpillars are, you know, host specialists on certain plant species. Um, but even the ones that aren't, even the ones that are generalists, uh, we want to put them back on that branch, right? So we've, we've whacked them off the branch. We, we see them. I will manually try to get, you know, the caterpillar back on the branch it came from. Uh, for most other things, ants and beetles, uh, things that are more mobile, I just shake the beach sheet out. I don't worry about it too much. Um, trying to think about anything else. Yeah, mo it's really the caterpillars that we care most about. Um, in terms of safety considerations, urticating hairs, you're right. So certainly that's something, that is something to um, warn folks about uh, is, is having people, especially in, in that case for caterpillars, whether they are hairy caterpillars, there are some that have spines to, to avoid touching them. And in that case, if you had one of those in your beat sheet, you can do your best effort to shake the beet sheet back onto the branch, right? Or often, you know, you can kind of try to slip a leaf under the caterpillar without actually touching it to get it back on that branch. Um, so we do warn folks about that. Uh, and poison ivy, depending where you are, that's, that's really one of our biggest things is depending on where people have to walk and making sure they know how to identify poison ivy and that sort of thing. Um, okay, so question for one day survey. At a minimal site with 10 branches, you'd be making 10 separate submissions, one for each branch. That is absolutely correct. So you, so what I just demonstrated was a single survey of one survey branch that has its own tag. We did a beat sheet, let's say. We entered it with the app um, or wrote stuff down. And that's, all right, you've done your one survey. You've got nine more to go. And you would hit those other nine branches in succession, knock them off in half an hour or whatever it takes you. Um, and then that would, and then you'd be done for the day. And then you'd have an estimate of here's what bird food looked like at my site on this date. Um, and then again, it's a matter of if you are able um, and willing to do that, to build up um, estimates across different dates. So you have a sense of that curve. Now, again, this is, this is, I want to make clear that just as you can create a site and you don't need to ask permission and you could create a site, um, and only ever do surveys one time and then decide it's not for you. And that's totally fine. And you, and you can even know in advance, you know, I'm doing this with a school group. We only have one or two dates before the end of the school year. And um, so we're not really gonna be capturing phenology. Um, that's fine. I won't know um, unless I really dig in and it's totally fine um, for people to contribute data in that way. Um, it's however it's useful for you. I mean, obviously from the research side of addressing questions about phenology, then we, we wouldn't use that site's data to answer questions about phenology, but we still might be able to use that site's data for asking questions about, well, at, this, at the time of year that that site did contribute things, you know, what was the geographic snapshot of bird food across North America? Or how does bird food vary from one tree species to another, et cetera? Um, okay, so feel free to keep, oh, here's another good question, a couple questions. Is it important to, I think, to be able to categorize insects rather than identifying them? Um, right, so absolutely. I mean, I think what makes this project accessible to a really broad range of people is that we don't require people be able to identify um, the millions of insect species that exist on our planet, right? That would be unreasonable, obviously. Um, and, you know, as some of us spend more time outdoors, we start to learn to identify some common species, but we're still going to come across things we don't recognize. So again, from the bird perspective, for the most part, knowing that it's a caterpillar is 90% of the information about how much energy content that represents for, for, for a bird. So that's why, and, and we expect that most people with a little bit of um, a little bit of training should be able to um, to learn how to identify a caterpillar versus a true bug versus a beetle. 
Um, even though some of those groups maybe they haven't accounted before, we think they can learn that. And I'll and I'll I'll move into how how some of the training materials we have for that. Um, and then Christina asked, should we only survey deciduous trees and shrubs, not conifers? So that's a great question. And that's, um, so the answer is, yeah, the project right now is really focused on what I would call broad-leaved um, vegetation. So in some cases, there may be some trees that are not deciduous, like hollies or magnolias that have leaves year round, um, but they're, they're broad-leaved. And so inspecting a leaf, a unit of 50 leaves, it's something that makes sense. For conifers, 50 needles, it, it kind of is that scenario of, you know, like 50 tiny leaves. Inspecting 50 needles isn't really a meaningful sample. And um, we're trying to, we're still trying to figure out a way to um, record effort. I mean, you can clearly do a beet sheet and people do, researchers do do beet sheets on coniferous vegetation or spruce or fir. Um, that's a useful thing to do, but we can't, um, we can't reconcile that effort. We're not gonna ask someone to count the number of needles uh, of a spruce tree that they just whacked. Um, and so we're still figuring out how to record that properly. So for now, it is broadly of vegetation. Um, okay, keep those questions coming in the chat, but I'm gonna, um, let me switch over now. Kind of left my PowerPoint behind, but that's okay because a lot of what we're doing is um, is covered here on the website. So what I'm going to do is go back to this website, and if we go to, I'm sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me go back to sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, if you go to the Explore tab of our website, you'll find a Maps and Graph page, Maps and Graphs. So this is, um, oh, I'm sorry, you know what, before I do that, I wanna show our training resources. Um, so actually, let's go to Learn. So in Learn, we have this identi Identification Skills tab. And this has links to a variety of resources. So this includes, we have like a, a little two-sided cheat sheet that you could print out and bring in the field with you. So it's got sort of a, a photographic guide to a bunch of groups, including a ruler printed on it. And then on the back side, just a little bit of information, um, text information about each of those groups. So you could print that out two-sided and have people carry that around with them to help learn to identify these different groups. Um, but we also have um, an arthropod quiz and what I think is the most useful is actually a virtual survey. So this gives you a sense of what it's actually like to um, carry out a survey replete with hunting for bugs and um, measuring them and identifying them. So I'm gonna click the play button and I'm gonna make it full screen for us here. So this, the initial level, we see this simple branch I can move this little magnifying glass around and click on bugs and say, oh, okay, that looks like an ant. I have a little ruler up here. And so I can estimate, all right, that looks to me, boy, I don't know, I'll say six millimeters. And then it tells me, oh, I've, I successfully identified it. It actually is eight millimeters. I said six, I got some points for it. And then it sends me back out and I can click on these other bugs. And so very quickly, if I get it, oh, let's see, if I get this one wrong. So this is a leaf hopper. I'm gonna call it a grasshopper. And I'm gonna estimate that at, I'm gonna estimate that one at eight. So we were looking for leaf hoppers, but I got the length right, I got some points. And maybe I don't see this bug. And so I say, okay, I'm done, next branch. And it shows me the bug I missed gives me some, some scores and then it gets harder. So now my next branch, it's not a nice white background, but there's blemishes on the leaves. And so anyway, so each branch is successfully harder. Here you can see all the bugs that were on it. Um, and so this is a great way you can get some practice, both searching for things that might be hidden. Now, of course, these aren't necessarily in natural, naturally camouflaged positions, but um, 
you get practice searching, you get practice identifying, and you get practice um, estimating lengths. And this is sort of an interface that resembles the app. Um, the other, and then the other link on this page that is also useful, we have this photo ID quiz, which actually gives you, um, it doesn't have, it just gives you the photo. But if you <clears throat> guess wrong, it actually gives you a little tip about what to look for to help you learn how to better identify that group in the future. And it keeps track of your score. And it, it pulls photos from iNaturalist. Um, it pulls research grade photos from iNaturalist. And it, so the quiz should be different every time. So it's not like you'll, run, you'll learn those 10 photos and, um, and then you don't get more practice. So it, it's a good way of giving you diversity of photos. Okay. Um, so those are some of the Arthropod ID resources. I will also mention on our participate tab, we have this resources page, which has links not only to those resources, but other handouts, a tip for you. Again, this is just kind of a, like a go-to, here are the things you need to think about that I've talked about in this webinar with respect to getting started, training people, links to you know, that ID sheet testing out the app um, and even a slide deck of at least um, a preliminary version of uh, our webinar. Here we have instructions for the app, um, instructions for building a beat sheet. We have the paper data sheet you can download. So this resource page has any document that's a PDF document that would be useful for this project is gonna be somewhere on this page. Um, how to review and explore, use the data visualization tools, which I'm about to show off. And then also a link to educational, I mentioned we have these educational learning activities, things that might be useful. If you're, if you're just doing this project because you're a parent at home um, and you're looking for some science project to do, some of these might also be useful complementary activities um, to do. Um, and on the learn page, this is a, um, this for educators page, it has a link to those, those um, learning activities, but it also has a list of side projects. And I'm not gonna talk about any of them, but again, these are nice complementary projects that um, if you really wanted to, to expand this, your involvement with Catapult Count and sort of explore some other aspects of, um, caterpillars, moths, birds, diversity, phenology, et cetera, then there are some ideas listed here. Okay, but I now wanna just show you once you've submitted some data, or even if you haven't submitted data, if you just wanna explore data from this project, here's how you can do it. So you go to the explore, the maps and graphs page. Uh, what we see at the top is just kind of a fun site leaderboard. So these are sites from across the country um, the default is actually, um, actually, let's see. So there's a few sites that have started surveying already um, in 2020. Most sites have not. Um, the default though is that it shows sites by which site has seen the most caterpillars or rather um, what proportion of surveys that they've done have had at least one caterpillar on it. So the highest, Right now is this site Earthwise Aware in Boston and Massachusetts. Typically, so this is the top of this leaderboard, but if we go way down here, we'll see much more typical values. Um, what I'm seeing, you can expect most places in North America where we've been doing this project, five to 10% of survey branches will have caterpillars. So that means if you set up a site with 10 branches, You'll, you'll be doing pretty well if you see one caterpillar on that day. That's another reason to, um, to do more branches. It's just you have the chance to encounter more things. Anyway, this, this leaderboard, this is really just a fun thing at the top. But the real data exploration occurs down below that. So first of all, we have a map. And the map is showing the location of existing caterpillars count sites at the moment across North America. And 
um, the color coding is a bit um, I think suboptimal right now, but it's actually providing some information to us. The default it's telling us is it's showing us percentage of surveys with caterpillars. Um, yeah, okay, so how those sites rank, basically what that leaderboard was ranking. So this light green site up here is the Earthwise Aware site and um, at 36%, the darker green is a lower percent um, of caterpillars. But you can visualize a number, you can change what you're actually visualizing on this map. I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but you know, I, I mentioned percent of surveys is what was being visualized here, but we can change that to density or biomass. Um, we can change which arthropod group we're visualizing. We can limit whether our visualization, oops, whether our visualization is for all plant species ever surveyed, or if you want to control for tree species, let's say we want to just look at caterpillars seen on red maple. Um, and we can just look at beet sheet or visual surveys, et cetera. So once we apply whatever filters, um, it'll change um, the visualization. It'll, it'll recalculate um, that stuff. And in this case, of course, not all sites have red maple. So we have more gray, gray dots here. But now we're looking just at, you know, controlling for tree species. How does caterpillar uh, prevalence vary? Now, once you've started going, you might really want to dig into your particular site, right? So, oops, if we um, if we zoom in on the map, I'm going to zoom in to one of our big sites here. Um, this is. Well, this is one without red maple here. Oh, no, that's the wrong one, sorry. Uh, zoom back out. Um, so the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Now this allows me to dig in to all the details of exactly what's happening at my site, specifically at my site, who has been doing the most surveys or seeing the most caterpillars, et cetera. Um, I've gotten knocked out of first place. I need to go and go out back up there and start hunting again. But in particular, we care about the data. And this is this phenology curve I've been talking about, which is really what we're after. So it's showing data for caterpillars at the Botanical Garden here in Chapel Hill from last year, um, from mid-May through late July. And it's showing how caterpillar um, you know, density basically went up and down um, it, it reached its real peak in mid-June, but that peak was, there was a little mini dip, but it was almost as high later in the month as well. Now, the nice thing is that on, in this data visualization page, you can add and compare um, kind of to your heart's content. So if we want, for example, we could also compare on here. Now we've been doing this survey at the Botanical Garden for five years. We could compare, well, what did 2019 look like compared to 2015? So we can do a comparison and we realize, oh my gosh, actually there's a lot of year to year variation in what these, these phenology curves look like. That's super interesting. And we didn't really have a good understanding of that before. So if this is a project you undertake and you, um, un you undertake it as sort of a long-term monitoring um, project, then it, pro it provides this tremendous insight into both sort of an, a general baseline so that we can evaluate whether insect populations are declining or not, but also just how variable is this phenology from one year to the next? How does it depend on you know, spring or winter weather, for example, um, et cetera? We can also, you know, we can add data for, let's say beetles, from a total, let's say beetles from Acadia National Park in Maine. Oops, I added 2020, but they haven't been doing stuff in 2020, right? And so you can compare from site to site, from year to year, one insect group to another. So once you have data in here, it's really um, uh, rich, all the different comparisons you can make. And importantly, uh, if you're doing something as a school project or a research project, um, you can download the data underpinning all of these graphs. If you want to do more with it, you can do that. You can download all these data. Um, 
And then the third data visualization piece, we got the map, we got the phenology graphs, we have composition, which just shows what types of arthropods are being seen at your site. So at the North Carolina Botanical Garden, we have this stacked bar plot, which is showing all these different types. We've got this large chunk of aphids and psyllids and gray, a lot of spiders. Caterpillars are actually a pretty small slice in pink, in this bright pink in the middle. But again, we can break this down in a lot of ways. First of all, currently it says it's grouping by site and it's just the North Carolina site. But if we wanted, we could add another site for comparison. So here we're comparing North, our North Carolina Botanical Garden to the kinds of bugs seen up in Acadia National Park. And again, we can keep adding um, uh, Austin. Hmm. Oh, it looks like they don't have any, they don't have any data. But anyway, we can keep adding multiple sites on there. Instead, we can, if this is my site and I really wanna know how this site varies from year to year, well, this, we can break it down by year. We can see how in 2018, we had this huge aphid outbreak. Actually, it was not really an outbreak. It was just one beach branch had these fuzzy beach blight aphids doing their boogie woogie dance. Um, and, but we visited that same branch so many times um, over the course of the season, they're showing up as a large proportion of the total uh, number of arthropods. We can also break down our site by the different plant species that are surveyed at that site. Um, and so again, thinking about, oh, well, which, 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 um, which tree species are really good for caterpillars, for example? Um, you know, this lets us help break the data down in that way. And we can actually plot different, different things on this y-axis that are slightly different metrics I don't have time to get into. So again, that composition data, you can download it. And in fact, you can download the entire Caterpillars Count database, if that's of interest to you. Um, so we make all of the data freely available for anyone. Um, so in the Explore, there's a data, a data download page. And that might be useful if you want to, and you can actually, you can specify on that page, if you just wanted to download the, all the data for your site, you can specify Okay, give me Acadia National Park for whichever year range, or you can just download for a particular group of arthropods, et cetera. Um, that's all freely available. Okay, let me see. We have just um, a few minutes left, so I wanna hit your remaining questions and see what else I um, have left. Actually, I think I'm gonna stop sharing, pop back out here. And okay, good. We have some good questions going here. Um, ah, great. Erica is out. Um, in New England, what day would you re recommend starting a survey? Right. And I didn't, I didn't really get into that. I said we're interested in this phenological curve, but I didn't give you dates. And obviously that those dates are going to vary depending on where you are in the country, right? So New England will be different than Louisiana or Florida, for example. Um, it really just depends on when you have leaves on the trees. What I'll say is that, um, you know, this is a, when you do the surveys, it depends, it's a, a combination of intersecting um, criteria, right? So it depends on when you have access to volunteers who would be carrying these surveys out. Um, and, how much they're interested and how long they're interested in doing it, um, whether they are constrained by other schedules like school schedules or things like that. So for example, I, because I teach until um, early May, I would love to get out in the field and start in North Carolina in mid-April around now, um, but I typically don't have field assistants and things like that ready to go until mid-May. So I start in North Carolina mid-May, even though leaves have been out for a month already. Um, but if you're able, then you know start as soon as as soon as leaves have flushed out, um, you can start. And what we recommend, I guess, the the window that we care the most about, again from the bird perspective, is really kind of mid-May 
through the end of July. And that's kind of no matter where you are in, in North America, because by the end of July, um, no matter where you are, birds are pretty much done breeding and they're um, you know, starting to, to gear up for heading back south already. And, and um, so that's kind of that window over which we're really hoping to assess this, this match or mismatch between the timing of bird reproduction and the timing of these insect resources. But we have some sites, they're ex super excited. Actually, Acadia National Park up in Maine is one of them where they have volunteers eager to continue monitoring all the way into October, through October because there's leaves on the trees and you can see that seasonal drop off. And actually, in many cases, there's an interesting fall peak in caterpillars in September that's less critical for whether birds are successfully raising their young. It may still be critical for birds as a food supply to get them through that fall migration period, but it's less a mismatch question at that time. So you can see interesting things in the fall. And if you were able to survey earlier, for example, in North Carolina, if we were able to survey from now, mid-April through mid-May, we would better be able to assess the match or mismatch between food resources and the resident birds, which are already nesting now. Um, but for, for New England, um, and you can actually explore, for example, up in New England, we have a lot of sites in Massachusetts. You can explore on our maps and graphs page, um, Broadmoor Wildlife Sanctuary, these Earthwise Aware sites in Boston. I think they typically go from um, mid or late May uh, through at least July. Um, but as soon as there are leaves in the trees, you can start to start. So what other questions do you all have um, as you're deciding whether this is actually something that would work um, in your personal context? What else have I not addressed? And I always leave out, there's, there's so many little bits and pieces that I inevitably leave out some parts. So uh, let me know what questions are occurring to you. I guess the, 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 another thing I'll mention, and this is linked on that, that URL, uh, which was on, the, on the, the front of our, let me paste it in the chat so that you can see it there also. Uh, if you didn't jot it down for yourself. So there's the URL with the agenda, which has links to all the various parts of the website where you can find these things. Um, and I'll just re-mention or mention that there's a frequently asked questions page. If you leave here and um, don't have, and th think of a question and I'm gone, that's a good place to start. Uh, if you've decided to do it, you just sign up when you're ready. Yeah, that's right. There's no formal process. Uh, I don't need to be um, I mean, you can feel free to contact me by email if you have a question about setup, but otherwise stay out of my inbox. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. No, you, I, you definitely don't need to ask permission. You can totally um, do everything online. Uh, and for those first questions, yeah, hit that frequently asked questions page. It's probably been answered. You can post a question. We have a discussion, a Google discussion forum. Someone might've asked that question before, but I'm totally happy to answer questions. Caterpillarscount at gmail.com is our address. And, um, and yeah, we're happy to be affiliated with SciStarter. Carolyn mentioned in the chat there, we're an affiliate. And if you're not already aware, SciStarter is a tremendous resource for finding out about all kinds of citizen science projects. They have platforms for you to track your involvement across, um, across projects. And um, yeah, so if you're looking to get involved, you can search, yes, everything from astronomy to zoology, absolutely. So um, yeah. Any other questions folks have? So hopefully, I mean, uh, this project, we know that it, uh, 
you know, getting a good estimate of bug density on one date, let alone multiple dates, takes a little bit of effort. This project isn't going to be for everyone. That's totally fine if in the end, this isn't going to work out for you. But um, even if it's not something that you do as, to, as far as submitting data, play our, play our virtual survey game. What else do you have to do these days? Um, you know, let her, use our bug resources, et cetera, and tell other people about it. Again, even not just nature centers, but tell um, parents looking for something to do with their kids in their backyard, right? Um, so please feel free. Hopefully all of you got the email, the newsletter that went out last night. I think I tried to add everyone who was registered. Um, so forward that on to people who you think might find this interesting. And yeah, look forward to seeing data streaming in. So thanks everyone for attending. And again, if you have questions, okay, Susan, I'll make sure to add you to our list. And if you, if you do create a site, then that will automatically, you'll automatically get added um, in that way. But excellent. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I hope everyone is staying safe and sane out there. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Yep.